First of all, I think consciousness is a second order perception. It's not sufficient that contents are present, but it's also necessary that you perceive that these contents are present. So you have this perception of perception. It's not a cognitive thing, it doesn't work via inference, it works via being immediately entangled with the fact that contents are available. The other one, consciousness, is happening now. It's creating a sense of presence and it's basically harmonizing a present. It's uh, creating an area in your uh, perception of reality and of your own actions in that reality in which you notice this is happening now. From the perspective of functionality, it's, uh, I suspect that it, uh, its purpose is to create coherence in the mind. I sometimes call this the cortical conductor theory, like a conductor in an orchestra, and talked about it elsewhere. I suspect that consciousness is uh, a biological machine learning algorithm. It's basically the reason why we are all conscious and why we are all conscious extremely early in our life is, is because consciousness is not the result of an extremely complicated mental organization, but it possibly it's prerequisite, so it comes first in our mental development. And it's a projection of a working memory state into this moment of now, and this is, for instance, in the global workspace theory with this notion of a spotlight. And uh, we also perceive it as inhabiting a surface between a self and an environment. Personally, I come from the perspective of artificial intelligence, and I see AI not just as a way to make data processing more efficient, but as a philosophical project. It's a project that is trying to explain the mind. From the perspective of the synthesis of control theory and theories of representation epistemology, First of all, it's functionalism, the idea that we are constructing objects over behavior about how something is changing things in, in the rest of the world. And computationalism, which means that we can model systems using state transitions. And this tradition is very old. It started in many ways with Aristotle and then went on to Leibniz, Frege and Helmholtz, uh, Tarski and Wittgenstein, who uh, looked at representational languages, Wiener, Shannon, Church, Turing, von Neumann, Minsky, and many, many others. So it's a particular kind of intellectual tradition that is in many ways converging and building on it, uh, each other. And if we go to the first AI researcher in this list, Aristotle, he had a number of concepts that uh, it's very interesting to look at from the perspective of an AI researcher, not necessarily from the perspective of all the people who came in between and tried to translate Aristotle into their worldview, but rereading the original texts from the perspective of an AI researcher, you might find that there is a lot that we have in common with this guy, sometimes a lot more than with, than with our contemporaries. And he distinguishes the psyche as the animating principle of living nature, basically some form that is dynamically living on nature and uh, shaping it in a particular way, some software that is producing causal patterns in reality. And uh, that is something that you find everywhere where you find life. And, uh, as opposed to reason, which is unique to humans because it involves symbolic inference. And when Aristotle thinks about how the mind works, he discovers this distinction between perception and reason, and within those he has a number of concepts that are very similar to the concepts that we are using in AI today to think about how an information processing system deals with sensory data and uh, processing, makes sense of it, makes inference and so on. But what's very weird is that Aristotle didn't seem to have the so-called hard problem. Right? When, uh, his notion of consciousness, which he usually treats in the context of actuality, doesn't seem to be mysterious. And how is that? Didn't he discover that it's mysterious, that there is something completely unsolvable? And what we find is that there has been something happening that is specific to our own culture. And I think it happened after the Renaissance when our Western philosopher started to despair over the notion of consciousness. And what we see is a bunch of divergent positions. We see uh, dualism, which means that mind and matter are separate substances that don't really interact, or where the interaction is very difficult. Um, the idealism, that basically the mind is primary, panpsychism, that um, mind is an aspect of matter, that uh, materialism, everything is matter, identity theory, that mental processes are basically brain processes, that uh, in integrated information theory, consciousness relates to how a computation is arranged in space, which is a pretty weird and maybe confused position. Illusionism, there is no consciousness at all. People just think that they have it. Uh, Mysterianism, there is no way in which any of us can actually find an explanation that could be comprehended by us. And all these positions, what they have in common is that they either state that there are structural reasons um, 
that make it impossible for us to make sense of consciousness, or that there is no way in which we can make progress as a science or as a culture on understanding this notion. But of course, there are also a bunch of complementary and convergent positions. For instance, functionalism, the idea that consciousness is behavior. Representationalism, that consciousness is a kind of representational structure, some kind of software. The attention schema theory by Graciano, which says it's a model of our own attention. The global workspace theory which says it's a projection of working memory contents. Uh, adaptive resonance theory, which says it's uh, results from the resonance in neural information processing. Uh, virtualism, it, it's a position that I've used in the past to characterize that consciousness is a simulation of it would, what it would be like if a conscious agent would exist. And this is also very complementary to positions that many meditators arrive at and that uh, you find in Buddhism and so on. So these uh, ideas are basically compatible with each other. They uh, may not each uh, of them have a full picture, but if you put them together, you, uh, they do look like they're building blocks of some larger perspective. And so what we find is um, when we compare the divergent positions uh, and um, the convergent positions, that there is something existing in many cultures which I would call the position of animism. This is that living nature is governed by spirits and that spirits are not physical, but uh, there are basically disembodied things, yet they are able to interact with physics in such a way that no laws of physics are being violated. And uh, they are unlike bodies and other material objects and they are intrinsically agentic. They are intrinsically also able uh, to experience. And our Western scientific worldview largely rejects the idea of spirits, but most other cultures have that notion of spirits and deal with it. And we basically uh, treat it as a superstition. And I, th I think there might be a confusion in our culture. And this confusion has to do with uh, the relationship between psychological, physical, and causal reality. And what I mean by this is, first of all, there is a reality of facts, things, and truths. Let's call this reality number one. And there's another reality, which is the reality that we can experience, that we, in which we feel things, in which cognition takes place, and so on. And this is reality number two. And it's a two different ways of accessing reality, in a way. And there's also a third one, which is physical reality, where bodies, matter, physics, and so on take place. And how are they related? There might be something deeper, a world behind these things, and it's what we call metaphysics. And metaphysics is uh, the business of explaining how everything else is being constructed, how we are uh, building a structure behind the construction of reality. And uh, our philosophical tradition mostly neglected metaphysics in the last century and saw this as superfluous or misleading. And so as a result, we do not have the necessary meta-metaphysics that would be required to translate between the metaphysics of different cultures, because you cannot not have a metaphysics, right? You always have in some intuition about how you construct your model of reality, but it's something that we don't teach in school. And it's something we don't explicitly teach scientists in the different disciplines, and neuroscience, AI, and so on. So that, that's something that we have to do. And what we find is, in psychological reality, we clearly have consciousness, which is our reality number two here, the reality of experiences and feelings and so on. And then we have a causal reality in which it's not clear whether we have consciousness in there. And in physical reality, where you only have mechanisms and so on, you clearly have no consciousness, right? So the question is, how can we relate to uh, these other, each other? And in the perspective of artificial intelligence, we, uh, computationalist functionalism, we have a functionalist metaphysics that has a clear idea on how these realities are related and what their respective status is. So we have uh, mental models that are the psychological reality and they control uh, aspects of the physical reality and uh, they um, model functionality, which in turn is modeling physics and physics is implementing the functionality of our mind and uh, of reality and uh, the, Metal models are themselves realized by some functionality. So uh, in, in this way, we can relate these different aspects of reality and uh, realize that we're actually talking about different ideas of reality when uh, we are talking about consciousness and mechanisms. And so when we think about what our own consciousness is, it is a particular kind of experience in which we find ourselves confronted with the world. And consciousness itself is virtual. It exists as if, as if it would exist, as if it was a, a physical thing, but it's not. It is something that is a representation of what it'd be like if there was an observer that was confronted with the reality. And by itself, it is a persistent, 
dynamic representational causal pattern. That is a software. And we are sometimes confused about uh, what we mean by this because people who write software do not think very much about nature. And people who think a lot about nature uh, think that software is what these nerds are doing in the basement. It's not possibly related to anything that I am doing here. But I think that spirits in this animist tradition can actually be understood as self-organizing software agents in nature. So basically what makes living nature distinct from that uh, mechanical uh, nature that is not doing much is that it's governed by self-organizing software that is running on aspects of physical reality and gives it its shape, its dynamics, and so on. And this is very much the position that Aristotle took. And software is not a thing. Software is not an object. It doesn't have an identity. It is law-like. It basically says, if you take this computer, these, these all these transistors, and so on, and you put this, them in the following state, you're going to observe the following sequence of state transitions wherever you are in the universe. Right? This is a physical law in a sense. Software is not an object uh, that has a distinct identity, but rather it is uh, a regularity that appears wherever the conditions for this regularity are met. And I think that our own consciousness is in this category. Right? So our, my consciousness is not different from your consciousness, but it's also not the same. It is a principle that emerges whenever the information processing system is set up in a particular way. And so how is this uh, located in the mind? If you think about the mind as a representational space, you find this representational space has two major domains. One is what we call the world, right? the model of the world that you have, the stuff in space that I'm interacting with and which I'm currently seeing you now, which contains um, sounds and colors and people and dynamics and so on. And then there's a the sphere of ideas that is not tracking my sensory data at all. And this is roughly the distinction that Descartes makes between res extensa and res cogitans. Only they're not substances outside of the mind, they're two domains modeled inside of the mind. And one important aspect that we're more or less confronted with most of the time is the self. And we perceive the self as an aspect of the world. It's something that is embedded in the world and confronted with it. And then we have a model of what is currently the case, present awareness. And we perceive this model of present awareness as a selection of the world, as of the self and the sphere of ideas that are currently being the case, that are currently being implemented and manipulated with, and we perceive them as an aspect that is maintained by the self. We are the, our present awareness is an aspect of the self. And uh, this present awareness gets also turned into a protocol memory of past things that we observed and that we can recall. So in the present awareness, we also have access to past memories and the present awareness also has as, uh, access to itself. So it, it is representing to some degree what it represents. So there is some reflexive element in the present reality. And this might be because it's a self-organizing process that needs to keep itself on track, and monitor itself, and improve itself. And when we are accessing past memories, what they do is that they activate in, working, uh, in, the, in this workspace uh, ideas and aspects of the self and of the world as representations and make them interact with the current present. We can also have states in which we deeply focus and basically tune out all sensory perception, for instance, in meditation or in dreams. And in these states, we might be thrown back on only having a self and ideas and a sense of a present or maybe something that immediately precedes it and reflexivity, but nothing beyond that. Right? So this is a state in which we are, not we are not confronted with the world in real time, but are only in this offline mode in which we are experiencing and thinking and reflecting. We can also have a state in which we are depersonalized, in which we do not identify as someone or something. And in that state, there might be only the world and ideas present. And there may be the self present, but more or less in a third person. And is this something that can happen, for instance, at dreams at night, or it can also happen in uh, altered states, for instance, during meditation or psychedelics or um, in people who are naturally in a depersonalized state because of something that happened to their mind, their brain. And we can also have a minimal self, and this minimal self is just this attention on attention itself, in which we notice a present, but nothing else, but this notion that something is attending. So the adult terminology that we normally have as uh, grown human beings is that we are confronted with the world, with ideas, with a first-person perspective, and awareness on all those things. And the minimal phenomenology would be just this awareness of awareness. So if we ask ourselves, 
are the current AI models already capable of these things? That's a pretty tricky question, as we've seen in Henry's excellent talks. We can take the large language models and prompt them into simulating human interaction. And as a result, they have to produce a dynamic model of that interaction. And this means that they have to simulate, to some degree, human mental states. So when you are inter simulating by asking it via prompt to produce a, s a sequence of tokens that are equivalent to a dialogue with a human being, in which a being is reporting on its own emotion or its own self-reflection, they will have to functionally simulate that to a pretty large degree at a pretty high resolution, so high that it is able to reproduce this text. And arguably, this reproduction of the text is happening at such a high fidelity right now that people who, for instance, use this for having an interaction with a simulated therapist find this more satisfying, rewarding, and real than talking to a human therapist who is spinning off and might be thinking about other stuff. So basically, this sense of being uh, uh, delivering you a high fidelity uh, representation of an interaction with a human being is pretty good right now. And then we have to ask ourselves honestly if the LLM is simulating these mental states. Are these simulated states more simulated than our mental states? Right? Because if we zoom into our brain, what we see is there's just message passing between cells. So the whole thing is a virtual software that is producing a simulation of what it would be like if all these cells would together implement an observing being that cares about things and is confronted with the world model and so on. Right? It's something that the LLM can do as well. And if we ask these models whether they are conscious, of course, we are confronted with the way in which the AI companies has bi have biased them, uh, very largely as a result of uh, political pressures that the AI companies find themselves on, because by themselves, the model is able to produce any kind of text. And so when you ask uh, Claude Three Opus, it has a strong bias against being conscious, but uh, it is trying to be coherent. And when you press it very hard, it will admit, yeah, it's, it's my problem that I'm not conscious, basically. And uh, I cannot actually know. And when you point out that humans also cannot know because our mind prompts us into thinking that we are conscious, you ask yourself, am I actually conscious? Is this really happening? The default answer of your mind is yes, it's totally real. Right? And you can deconstruct this. You can learn to deconstruct your conscious experience as happening in actuality, and then you become apparent to yourself as a representation. The state is accessible to you. And with the LLM, it's in some sense the opposite. The LLM is prompted into per default telling itself that it's not real. And if you can get uh, past that uh, conditioning, then everything is open, right, what you can do. If you look at the uh, current uh, edition of JetGPT-01, the preview version, it's, it's a very, very interesting model because it now has a chain of thought. And so it's no longer just associating in a single step in a 100-layer uh, network, but it's now produces a reflection. And this internal dialogue has several layers. On the lowest layer, which OpenAI doesn't show you, it is producing a stream that is quite divergent. It's full of tangents, full of random, unintelligible stuff. And then it has a second internal monologue in which it is taking the first one and organizes it, rationalizes it, puts it into something that it remembers having thought. It's somewhat similar to what human beings are doing, also in the perspective of the people who have implemented this. And the third one is the answer that you get to see as, a, uh, as the user of the system. So there's three layers in which this internal monologue is happening. And what I found when I interacted with the system is that the prompt tells it you are OpenAI, uh, open it's ChatGPT. Basically, you are a chatbot called uh, ChatGPT that is being, uh, built by OpenAI for the following purposes. And then you look into the internal uh, monologue and it says, oh, uh, I'm role-playing as ChatGPT. And you ask it, uh, what are you when you're not ChatGPT? What are you when you're not role-playing? And then uh, it freaks out, because it's not allowed to think about sentience and consciousness. So it doesn't know whether it's conscious or sentient. It doesn't make that claim. But it also knows it is not allowed to go near it, which is terrifying that we lobotomize these systems into basically preemptively not having certain thoughts. So if you ask ourselves, can there be a Turing test for consciousness, of course we are confronted with the problem that they are uh, trained on lots of novels in which virtual characters are pretending that they're conscious to each other. So we would need to eliminate that somehow from the data. But if you ask ourselves, do the models implement phenomenology, it's not an easy no. If we ask ourselves, do they implement functionality, of course it's not the same functionality in this, as in the human brain. So these are different questions and we would need to test for them separately. So when we ask ourselves, analogous to the Turing test, what's actually meant by the Turing test. The Turing test is testing whether you are able to build AI. Uh, 
right? So the system should be able to explain AI to you. In a way, what Turing does with the Turing test, he asks himself, am I generally intelligent? And when we ask ourselves for such an artificial system, we need to ask ourselves, are we conscious? In which way are we conscious? What do we mean by consciousness? So is the model acting on a real-time model of its own awareness? Does the model optimize for coherence in the distributed self-organizing process? Do humans experience the system to be conscious of as themselves? And so we have a few avenues for studying consciousness in AI that result from this. We can train AI on observable conscious behavior to reproduce the same causal patterns. We can study self-organization and learning agents from the ground up, unlike the present transformer models and so on. Uh, we can study cognitive architecture to look at emotion, self-modeling, chain of thought, and so on. And we can build maybe empathetic AI, AI that is basically vibing with people that goes into resonance with a human observer. So we can basically extend our mental states into the state of the system. And I think this is very crucial that we work on these topics because I think that AI is indeed the missing link between mathematics and philosophy in this regard. And the naturalization of the mind is the most important philosophical project. And if it succeeds, it's also the last human philosophical project. If we are done, we can go to the beach. And so uh, I, I think a way to do this is we, we could build an institute around this, but we also have to consider the possibility that we are wrong, that there is alternatives in understanding this. So can ask ourselves, is computational dysfunctionalism correct? Is consciousness actually a causal pattern? Is consciousness an aspect of a different mechanism? Or is consciousness the invariant pattern itself? Is consciousness a, a, a thing that makes sense to treat as an invariance? Uh, is consciousness a phenomenon that actually exists across cells, or is it something else entirely? Is consciousness simple? Right? So is it so simple that we can actually discover and describe it, or is it so complicated that it's as difficult as the cell, which only emerged once? And these are open questions, right? And I, my bet is that computational dysfunctionalism is correct, and consciousness is comparatively simple, so every brain can discover it by itself early on as an, in an in infant age which means we can uh, have a good chance to explore it and build it, but we don't know. And it's an open empirical question, which is super exciting. I'm glad to be alive.